Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wolfson College and welcome to our annual Southrise lecture and particularly warm welcome to um, the Lord uh, Southrise, who's Amo, who's joined us today. So thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, and we're delighted to welcome Cyril Almeida as our speaker at tonight's lecture. Uh, Cyril is a Pakistani journalist working for a number of outlets. He's for many years worked at Dawn, uh, now works for The Economist and other, other organizations. Um, he was born and raised in Karachi, a member of a community of Goan Catholics who migrated to Goa, from Goa to Karachi more than 100 years ago. Uh, he took his undergraduate degree in economics from the top business school in, in, uh, in Pakistan, LUMS, the, the Lahore University of Management Sciences in 2003. Uh, he came to Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, earning himself a second degree in law here. Uh, and Cyril returned to Karachi and he's built himself a reputation as an insightful and fearless journalist and commentator. Uh, and in April 2019, he was named the International Press Institute's 2019 World Press Freedom Hero. Well, those of you who know Pakistan uh, will be aware that you could argue that its history has at been at base a working through of a very complex relationship between the military and civilian politics. There has been the very obvious alternation in political power between military and civilian governments, but even when the government has been civilian, um, the power of the military has always been a significant factor. And many civilian administrations have fallen when they appeared to lose the implicit backing of the army. And equally, many civilian administrations have come to power with the implicit backing of the army. And this isn't simply to call the military a malign force in politics. Uh, they're often regarded as the most professional and genuinely national force in Pakistan, held in high esteem by many in the country. So journalists tend to tread carefully around their coverage of the military in Pakistan. And Cyril appears to have the excellent judgment and impeccable journalistic credentials and good sense to say things which many others feel unable to say in ways which are difficult to challenge and which do not appear to carry an ulterior political motive. When he talks about the boys, we know who he means. Over the last 12 months, as the Imran Khan administration has left and the Shabazz Sharif administration has arrived, he's allowed us to understand the civilian military context in the background, which, at least to me, has been very persuasive. And those of you following politics in Pakistan will know that we have today had another significant shift in the balance of military power in Pakistan. So without any ado, Cyril... The floor is yours. Um, Sir Jim, faculty, ladies and gentlemen, um, Lord Sarfraz, thank you for having me. Um, it was a pleasant surprise to be invited last year by Sir Jim to deliver this year's uh, Sarfraz lecture. In fact, when he reached out to me over Twitter DM, I wasn't sure if it was a hoax. If you've ever seen my Twitter DMs, you know, you'd be suspicious too. But I'm glad to report, and that it was not a hoax, and I'm glad to be here today. And also, uh, given what Sir Tim mentioned, for those of you who've heard the news from Pakistan today, congratulations. Our long national nightmare is over. Right. Pakistan is not doing well. It has not been the land of good news in recent memory. The past 12 years, 12 months, have been particularly tough. Everyone here is familiar with the headlines, flirting with economic default, catastrophic flooding, an unceasing civil military crisis that has sucked in everyone and everything. And gathered here in Wilson on a late November evening, none of us really knows what the new year will bring in Pakistan. We can guess, but I assure you, it's impossible to know. Pakistan is murky like that. So tempting as it is to dive into what the new army chief will do and what Imran will do to the new army chief, perhaps it may help to zoom out a bit 
and look at the wider canvas of Pakistan. Why has Pakistan fallen behind? Why is it increasingly looking like the sick man of Asia? This in a region rife with tumult and disarray. And all of that before factoring in the disruption of COVID. So I'm here today to try and take a stab at a seemingly straightforward question. Why isn't Pakistan developing adequately or at all in some areas? Now, I should warn you, I'm no expert. In fact, as Sir Tim mentioned, I've never studied beyond a bachelor's. The first in Pakistan and the second, of course, here in Merton. I think I gave my tutors nightmares, though I escaped with that gold standard of moderation, a 2-1. Um, but I do know Pakistan, and having lived in Islamabad since 2010, have had a front row street to much of Pakistan's recent politics. On occasion, I've been dragged into that ring and bummeled, but such are the risks in Pakistan. So, the basic question. Why is Pakistan not developing adequately or at all in many areas? Most of you here will be familiar with the numbers and the dismal statistics, and I won't, I'm not keen to bore you with too many figures. But for those less familiar with the scale of the challenge, the crisis in Pakistan, I quote from an op-ed from Mr. Mifta Ismail, former finance minister of Pakistan until September. Mifta wrote in an op-ed last week, Pakistan's per capita income is below every country in South Asia except Nepal, and below even the average of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. In human development indicators, such as education, infant mortality, etc., we do even worse. Mr. continues, in 75 years, our governments haven't been able to deliver economic growth, security of life, of prop or property, education or health, or even clean drinking water. The hard truth is that our governments haven't been able to solve any major problems facing Pakistan. So I think it's fair to say that Pakistan is the sick man of Asia. The question is why. Usually this answer is debated in binary terms in Pakistan. Pakistan is a development laggard because of the military security agenda. Or Pakistan is a development laggard because of the civilian leadership's poor governance skills. Or more straightforwardly, Pakistan has lagged behind because of alternating decades of civil and military rule. Now, there is some logic to this. The military, the military security agenda is surely a drag on development for many reasons. Some of them are obvious, starting with the economic trade-offs of investments in people versus investing in militaries, but also because of external policies, a historical rivalry, enmity with India, and an Afghan policy that has helped perpetuate instability, such security policies have effects on your economy. Pakistan shares a border with four countries, three, three of whom it is not on good terms with. There's also the undeniable reality of poor civilian governance. Again, I can do a little better than quote Mifta. On education, he writes, Pakistani governments spend over 2,000 billion rupees on education annually but half of all school-aged children aren't even in school, and of those who matriculate from government schools, most can't solve a simple sum involving percentages or write a decent paragraph. The issue here is not lack of resources, but of will. Without this resolve, the money we are spending on education is being wasted. The failure of civilian governance in Pakistan is ubiquitous and it is real. It's the small things that are big. Take drinking water that Mr. mentioned. Growing up in Karachi in the 1980s, we'd get water from the tap, and then you'd boil it, and then you'd drink it. Um, that too, out of an abundance of caution. Some people just drank straight from the tap. Today, for many Pakistanis, that's incomprehensible. First, the very idea of running tap water in many cities would strike people as odd. And drinking water from the tap, that's impossible. If you're in the major cities and have a bit of disposable income, you have drinking water, drinking water delivered to your house in individual canisters by private companies. Think about the inefficiencies and repeat costs of that. So the civilian leadership's poor governance does play a role. It would be foolish to pretend that they already know how to fix things if only the military would get out of the way. Alternating decades of civil military rule have also wrought their own damage. If every 10 years or so you decide to cancel the prevailing system of governance and switch to another kind, you're not going to get much good. 
the pendulum swinging from military to civilian governments and back again has been a problem. But scratch around that theory a bit, and you find or you start to see something else. We know that Pakistan has never had a period of full civilian rule in terms of totality of control or meaningful control even. But the military rule periods have been fuzzy too. Look back to the Musharraf years. Pakistan was ostensibly under full military rule. It was a one-man show, and that man was the swaggering commando Musharraf. But was he really totally in control? Because of the Supreme Court, by 2002, Musharraf was faced with a choice if he intended to stay on in power. He had to find fresh political legitimacy. He couldn't just say, I'm a dictator, you guys have to live with me or else. That's not how it works in Pakistan. So first, Musharraf cast about for fresh political legis- legitimacy <coughs> sorry, through a referendum. He held a referendum on himself and gave himself five years as president. But because it was farcical and everyone knew it, it wasn't enough. Musharraf needed something more substantive for political legitimacy. Enter the PMLQ, the so-called King's Party. It was supposed to be a new party, but it was basically the old political guard, the electables gathered under a new banner. This was Musharraf, architect of Cargill, soon to be one of the three most famous people on planet Earth alongside George W. Bush and Osama bin Laden, a defining figure of the post-9-11 world, and here he was, unable to get past the standard civilian political structures of Pakistan. From political legitimacy, Musharraf had to turn to the very civilians that he had tried to escape, get away from. So political rule was not nearly, sorry, military rule was not nearly as fully military as it may have appeared from the outside. Which brings me to my main point today. Pakistan's failure to progress, I believe, is a result of the hybrid regime in place in the country today. There's a bit of history to this term in Pakistan. In September 2019, I'd written a column in which I'd wrote of the Imran government, welcome to the hybrid regime. The idea had been knocking around in my head for a year since Imran had been installed in power. I'd had some time on my hands, having suspended the column in early 2019, Those were interesting times. I was on break from writing, still on the staff of the paper, but basically waiting to see if things would get better. There had been a treason case, two bans on leaving Pakistan, and a bunch of other stuff that I've never really discussed publicly. So after nine months of not writing and watching the climate of fear and repression grow worse in Pakistan during Imran's first year in office, I returned to writing the Sunday column. I was looking for something splashy and clever to say, Transition to democracy after Musharraf era seemed dead. Soft democracy, weak democracy. None of that seemed to fit what appeared to be a more aggressive, more sophisticated new version of something. Because while parties have been swapped out of power, in and out of power before, there was something different about the Imran experiment. The methodical manner in which Nawaz Sharif had been politically sidelined, effectively ousted from politics the brazen manner in which the path to power for Imran had been carved out, the muzzling of the media, the rise of a so-called narrative steered by the military and through social media in favor of Imran. It felt different, and so I was thinking about it, and I came up with the idea, the hybrid regime. Now, this may be a good time to remind all of you of my lack of academic expertise. I was kind of aware of a body of literature of the, about the hybrid regime worldwide, the third wave of democracy, the Cold War, backdrop, etc. But my focus was Pakistan and trying to describe things there. Hybrid, hybrid regimes seem new and novel, appropriate. In the column writing business, that is often enough. Luckily, other people in Pakistan were also looking for some way of describing what appeared to be the end of the transition to democracy after the Musharraf years and this new phase that Imran represented. So hybrid regime resonated and became popularized, and here we are. And maybe, lost in the noise, is that the hybrid regime was actually my second to last column. A couple of weeks later, I resigned from the paper and became that unremarkable species, the unemployed former newspaper employee columnist. So I'm quite pleased to be here today because it's given me a chance to flesh out some more of this idea of the hybrid regime in Pakistan. What is it? It is murky. Sometimes the hybrid regime looks more military than civilian. Sometimes, occasionally, it leans towards the civilian side, and sometimes it's just a muddle, 
unclear to the outside observer who is calling the shots in which domain. Perhaps even unclear to the people on the inside. But we can trace its contours. In Pakistan, the hybrid regime divides power between civil and military and separates authority and responsibility. The division of power between civil and military is the first part. The hard military stuff, the military keeps for itself. The size of the army, the army decides. The budgetary and equipment demands of the military, the military determines. While constitutional form de mandates a defense ministry, the ministry is basically captured by the military and staffed with retired officers. The nuclear command, that too is under the control of the army. Basically, for our purposes here today, what the military wants in the military realm, the military keeps for itself. This is unsurprising. What starts to get more interesting is in the realm of policy, specifically foreign policy and national security. In Pakistan, the army decides what threats Pakistan must respond to. Now, it isn't necessarily and automatically a bad thing when a military figures out threat perception. There are some things, even I would agree, that generals are good at. Where it starts to get more complicated is where the military both perceives the threat and decides the response. And where it becomes even more complicated is where the military is in charge of determining which opportunities Pakistan can grab hold of and which it must avoid. On foreign policy, the military wants to determine Pakistan's posture towards the US, India, Afghanistan, China, Saudi. On national security, the military determines the threats to Pakistan and what to do about them. If you notice, that doesn't leave much for the civilians to do. But the civilians are an occasionally restless bunch and do raise their heads above the parapet every once in a while. They get smacked in the head for their efforts, but they do try. And it's those efforts that lead to conflict a muddle and resentment at times. A recent example. A few months ago, I met former Prime Minister Imran Khan, and he talked about his trip to, the, to Russia on the eve of the Ukrainian invasion. Imran had asked to keep the conversation off the record, this part of it, but I don't think he'll mind now that Bajwa is retiring. So I'll share with you what he told us. As many of you may recall, Imran turned up in Moscow and was the first foreign leader to meet President Putin in Moscow in hours after the invasion had begun. Publicly, Imran had billed the trip as a big deal for Pakistan, seemingly fancying himself as a player on the global stage. But privately, Imran had his doubts. He told us that he rang up Bajwa the night before he was to travel to ask him, should I postpone the trip? But the army assured him that the trip was both a good idea and necessary for Pakistan. There were some contracts that the military wanted to sign, so Imran went ahead with the trip. The blowback to that decision seemed to catch Imran off guard. There was incredulity abroad and scorn at home. Imran seemed quite affected by the attacks. So he rang up the military when he got back, wanting to know why he was getting all the blame. When I asked him, he said, they just hung me out to dry. Of course, that's Imran's version of events, and the army has its own. But it should be obvious why hybridity is a problem. When one side thinks they're the boss, and the other side thinks it's actually their job, confusion and worse occur. There are a couple of less recent examples. Back in 2009, the Americans had decided that after the restoration of democracy in Pakistan, US aid should flow more to the civilian side in Pakistan. That did not sit well with the Pakistan military, and they kicked up an almighty fuss. In the end, the Kerry Luger bill was essentially torpedoed, and the US-Pakistan relationship continued to be a security-first relationship. That episode was the military telling the civilians, you guys get to play government, but we still call the shots. There's a less well-remembered example from those days, too. Asif Zudari, newly elected president of Pakistan, was probably having thoughts of weighing into security debates and uh, gave an interview to the legendary Karan Thapar in India. In that interview, Zardari mused about the possibility of Pakistan adopting a nuclear no-first-strike posture. A big deal, and predictably, it made headlines around the world. 
A few days after the Thapar interview, I met General Kiani, then the Army Chief in Karachi. He would occasionally uh, call up a bunch of journalists and sit, uh, make a sit down for these marathon sessions that would run late into the night. And so at that meeting, somebody asked General Kiani about Zardari's remarks about no first strike in Pakistan. The president is entitled to his opinion, Zardari said dryly, before turning to the next question. <coughs> so don't make the mistake of thinking the civilians don't, in their own way, to the extent they know of these matters, try to shape security policy. But the military closely guards national security and foreign policy. That's the first part of the hybrid equation. The second part is the civilian side. The military foists off on the civilians human and economic development as residual responsibilities. This has been particularly pronounced since the end of the Musharraf era. The military appears to have realized that Pakistan's too messy, too big, and just too difficult to run by itself, especially in the realm of the economy and service delivery. The sophistication of the hybrid regime today stems in part from lessons learned during the Musharraf era. It's one thing to be the army chief. Your day begins and ends with military matters. But when you're running the country directly, after your morning military meeting, you have to meet the finance minister and then the education minister and maybe the water and power minister for lunch. You quickly realize Pakistan's broke out of ideas and problems are piling up everywhere. The Musharraf years taught the army what it knows it doesn't know. So housing, education, health, transport, it's all put in a bag and dumped in the civilian's lap. Here, solve this, this is what you've been elected for. Except it's not quite as simple. The military withdraws from certain areas and demands that civilians fix certain problems as their core elected responsibility until the military decides otherwise. The tasks dele delegated to the civilians are amorphous and subject to change in the hybrid regime. There is also frequent interference. Yesterday, in General Bajan's farewell address, he claimed credit for the military having resolved the multi-billion Rikudik arbitration, a power plant project with Turkey, and a bunch of other things. The military's approach to, uh, to civilian governance can be described as solve this unless it gets in our way, or we require otherwise, or we want to do it ourselves. Part of the problem is structural. The military's penetration into vast areas of the economy and the demands that creates for catering to military preferences. Pick any area, any one of the recent governments. Isaac Dar is back as a finance minister today, but when, in 2017, he was run out of office and the country, was believed to be under pressure from the military. The military needed money for its commercial empire that Dar didn't have or wasn't, either didn't have or wasn't willing to give. So the military decided he had to go. So while there were many reasons why Dar was not a good finance minister, the reason he ultimately lost his job had little to do with his handling of the economy. Instability also comes from personality clashes. In that meeting with Imran a couple of months ago, he told us another story about Baja. He had a lot of stories about Baja. It's like he didn't like him or something. <laughs> so Imran tells us that Bill Gates was visiting Pakistan, and he was informed that Bill Gates is coming to Pakistan. And Imran suggests that you know, he knew him, Bill Gates or knew of him, and he wanted to meet him as Prime Minister of Pakistan. So he says, um, of course, as you, many of you will know, Bill Gates travels to Pakistan because of his anti-polio efforts primarily, not really a business thing. Anyway, the Prime Minister of Pakistan decides, I want to meet Bill Gates. So he calls his aide and says, you know, find out what his schedule is and, you know, arrange a meeting with Bill Gates. So the aide comes back. This is Imran telling us the story. And he's like, uh, I'm sorry, sir, the schedule of uh, Mr. Gates has already been decided. And everyone's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, uh, when he arrives at the airport, he's going straight to Army House, which is where the Army Chief lives in Rawalpindi, and that's where he's going to be all day, right? So this is Imran, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, saying to himself, and then he's telling us that, you know, I'm the Prime Minister of Pakistan. I just found out this guy's coming to Pakistan. I want to meet him for uh, sort of investment discussions, and he's out there already going to spend the whole day with the Army Chief. And then Imran went off into another rant about, you know, he's like, I couldn't believe it. I'm the prime minister, and I'm here, and here I'm only finding out that his schedule 
had it already been made, and then we didn't even know about it. They went off into another rant about how Bajwa does, would meet diplomats without telling him. They would travel abroad without uh, informing the prime minister, etc. So there is this personal element to instability. Because of the, div the division of labor between civil and military is arbitrarily decided by the military, and it is subject to change on the military's whims, there is disagreement and resentment. Now, with some apologies to any mathematicians in the room, I use the phrase first order and second order issues to try and explain why the hybrid regime not only doesn't, but can't deliver. Second order here doesn't mean less important. It just means it flows from what comes earlier. Health, education, safe public safety, economic growth, service delivery, the building blocks of a healthy society, all the stuff vital to progress, everything that can be clubbed under the rubric of development, that's second order stuff. The first order is the locus of power. It is essentially in Pakistan being described as the swing of the pendulum between civil and military. 10 years of one, another decade of another, back and forth, back and forth, until nothing is settled. But my idea is that the pendulum is not swinging between the two extremes of dictatorship and civil rule. It is mostly stuck somewhere in the middle, wiggling a bit, but mostly in the narrow range. That is Pakistan's first order challenge, to get out of the muddled middle, where civil and military have overlapping domains and where authority and responsibility are separated. Systems don't work when one side says, this is your job, you fix it. But if it gets fixed, the credit is mine. And if it gets worse, the fault is yours. The core first order challenge of Pakistan is that the version of the hybrid regime we have is an amorphous, changeable division of labor between civil and military. This often depends on the whim of the military and sometimes the relative strength of the civilians. And the version of the hybrid regime we have in Pakistan separates authority and responsibility in fundamental ways. You, the civilians, are responsible for development, growth, and growth, but you have to do it in a way that doesn't step on military toes, which is a big ask when the military has deeply penetrated the economy and has vast interests in civilian sectors. The hybrid regime doesn't just not work, it can't work. But here's where I come to another and final problem. It has deepened the intractability of the hybrid regime. Pakistan's civilian leadership has gradually, over the decades, and now decisively over the last decade, moved towards a new equilibrium. The major political parties have internalized and accepted as a starting point that the military will have a role in politics and policy. The civilian leadership has thrown the towel in. No longer is any major party seeking the ouster of the military from the political realm altogether. Now, it is just a question of a matter of degree. This applies to the PPP, and it applies to the PMLN, and it applies to the PTI. This was not always the case. Rewind to the 1980s. The major political opposition in Pakistan and allied civil society movements were united in the idea that the military should get out of politics. It was never likely they would succeed, but at least there was that conceptual clarity. But I think it's fair to say that there was a real and genuine desire to see the eventual realization of democracy in Pakistan, an aversion to cutting deals uh, to remain in power. That's gone now. Imran realized he couldn't win on his own, so he teamed up with the military until he fell out with them. Even now, he goes to some lengths to placate the wider military and wants them as a partner in governance. The PMLN and PBB are back in power because of a deal with the military, whatever the denials of all three. It is no longer just the military's propensity to meddle in the civilian domain. The acceptance of the civilians of military meddling as a natural state that has to be managed, not defeated, has deepened the conundrum of the hybrid state. So how does Pakistan get to the promised land? A constitutional democracy with a limited role for the military. Honestly, it's not obvious. One possibility is implosion the contradictions and demands of the hybrid regime causing it to collapse, leaving someone to fashion a new system, something new from the rubble left behind. But collapse, implosion, or explosion are alarming things. 
No one should take them lightly. There's also this lubrious possibility of the weight of public opinion adding as a force for, acting as a force for good, a force for correction. Since his ouster in April, Imran has shown the possibilities of mass public support to bring pressure to bear on the state. Whether that can be used to force positive change in the hybrid regime, or if that's even Imran's aim, is of course debatable. What Pakistan needs, though, is a democratically rejuvenated political leadership, civilian political leadership, and a military leadership that stops insist insisting it is apolitical and actually starts behaving like it's one. Of course, what's not happened in 75 years is unlikely to happen overnight now. The problem, returning to something I said earlier, is trajectory. Zoom out from the details, look past the noise of the present, and the trajectory of Pakistan is wrong. The country's leadership and the country's results have both been trending in the wrong direction. So we have to look outside the state, in society, to see if there are trends visible here. Obviously, I'm from and interested in the Pakistani media. So I thought I would close with a note about what's happened to the Pakistani media in recent years. And I think it may come as no surprise to any of you to discover that it's rooted also in the Musharraf era. Um, as most or some of you will know, uh, in Pakistan, when I grew up in the 1980s, had one state-run TV channel and a handful of newspapers and publications, just barely sort of catering to a, sort of a small audience. Um, and then this boom happened in the late 1990s, early 2000s. What's not known, or maybe not understood, is why Musharraf liberalized the media in Pakistan. Um, you have to go back to India, as most things that start with Pakistan end in India. And India was on a path of liberalization in the 1990s. And so you had this new middle-class media that arose from in India, right? And it was powerful. It was able to rally nationalist support in India in a way that Pakistan was having a look at it and was like, oh, this is interesting. Then two things happened. Kargil and the... Uh, Delhi parliament attack in 2001. You saw how India was able to mobilize its public support and focus it on Pakistan in a way that no state-run TV channel could do. Now, this was a challenge to the Pakistan military for two reasons. One, because, because of thanks to satellite TV, as we call it, dish antennas back then, Indian, as they saw it, propaganda was being directly into Pakistani homes. Secondly, they saw the potential of this model. You have a private sector media drawn from a nationalist middle class, and it's likely to sort of rally national spirit when required more effectively than PTV or Durdashan could. So Musharraf um, obviously went down that path and opened the floodgates to private TV in Pakistan. This was a mistake as far as the military was concerned, and they realized it eventually from their perspective. By the end of the Musharraf era, the lawyers' movement, and of course, the Red Mosque incident, had shown that the Pakistani TV channels, this new medium that had arisen, suddenly had grown more powerful and more influential than the state. At some point, Hamid Mir was probably just as famous in Pakistan as Musharraf, and certainly more famous than Pakistan's Prime Minister, Shokat Aziz. Right? So in the end of the Musharraf era, there was a decision made within the military that this is a beast that we have to tame. We've unleashed it. It has certain potential for our nationalist needs, but it's grown too big, it's grown too powerful, and needs to be cut down to size. It took them a few years to come about to do it. Musharraf era ended in tumult and chaos. And so you fast forward to the attack on Hamid Mir in Karachi in 2014. At that time, Geo was probably you know, number one in Pakistan by a mile, a country mile, ahead of the other TV channels. But because of what Geo did in the aftermath of the attack on Hamid, where they ran a multi-hour uh, TV program accusing the then serving ISI chief of orchestrating the attack on Hamid, the military was able to pounce. And they haven't let up since. Exhibit B was, of course, me. Fast forward two years to 2016. Now, this was more interesting. Maybe I'll say that because it concerned me. But until then, the military had decided that, you know, there's this little pocket of English media in Pakistan, print media. We let it be. 
it has its benefits. People who read it are largely outside Pakistan or a few people who are not that politically well connected um, or in terms of for domestic politics. Um, but once the military gets into certain projects, once it had realized, look, we need to tame TV, it didn't stop there. It was like, now we got to go on onwards. We got to take on English print. The narrative must be controlled by us. And of course, then there was the rise of social media and this you know, creation of the so-called fifth generation warfare. This was an incentive or a, I would say, a self-created incentive in order to go in and control the narrative in Pakistan. Now, of course, in April, this has exploded spectacularly and has now sort of come around to haunt them. But I don't think it's going to stop. I think, as with most things, the military has made an institutional decision that Pakistan's media is influential, but Pakistan's media is too influential to be independent. And so I think going forward, once they have enough time to be able to regroup, as happens, you're going to be able to see, sadly, some of the same stuff again. On that note, um, thank you all for giving me your time. Over to you, Sir Jim. So we have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, and we have a runner with a mic. Um, might I abuse my position with the first one, and then I'll come to others. So my, my first question would be, in a way, what you describe is a whole set of civilian powers, forces, the media, etc. But a block that is the military. Mm -hmm. Can you, and that maybe because we don't really know that much about what goes on inside it, but can you do any kind of discussion of forces within the military itself? Is it, is it monolithic, or what are the differences within the military itself? Yeah, um, no, it's not monolithic, and it's never been. There's always been factionalism within the Pakistan army, but it has been managed and kept out of the public eye for the most part in our history. There have been moments and spurts where we've seen it break out. But with Imran, everything has changed. Um, I think the intensification of the factionalization, um, I think, I believe, the vast majority of your officer corps does support him, is the coterie of generals at the top, because they're in policy-making decisions, self arrogated policy-making decisions who have that problem. Um, so I think the hybrid regime, the experiment of bringing Imran in, the purposefulness in which it was done, the penetration of the ISI into sort of broader politics and society, the media, the ISBR's vast propaganda network, all of this both sort of turbocharged the military's uh, role in these issues and at the same time has created cleavages within. Very famously, of course, this whole current crisis in Pakistan began after uh, General Bajwa tried to get rid of his ISI chief, and the Prime Minister did not want to get rid of him. So I think for some of us, perhaps myself, uh, it is alarming that factionalization is something that has risen to a level that for the first time, I think you can ask reasonable questions about is the army chief really fully in charge of his own army? And this has always been the case. I grew up as an article of faith in Pakistan. There is a one-man army. What the army chief issues, what he wants, happens. Well, we've seen it in 2016. We've seen it earlier. We've seen it with the dharnas in 2014 that began. That seems that the army chief is unable to impose his will immediately and forcefully. He has to allow certain factions, powerful factions, to maybe you know, sort of articulate their approach, and then. We have our first question here. Thanks. I'm interested to know. You use the word hybrid. Why not the word collusion? That's the first thing. The second thing is we know that the military has deep roots. Um, years ago, when my son, he was about well, three years old at the time, three or four, four he said, um, and he had conflicts in the morning, and he said, Mama, why do the soldiers make conflicts? Because it was a 4G conflicts, you know. Correct. Um, <laughs> and that is a profound question if you, if you think that one through. Um, and the third little bit is, do you think the army... Um, 
and religion, I guess, I don't know, is kind of the opium of, opium of the people, is a combination of how those two forces work their way through society as a whole. Sure, wow. Why, why collusion? Um, yeah, of course, I think that's what I was trying to get at, that this hybrid regime is actually increasingly a product of collusion by the civilian leadership in the country. Previously, it would be imposed by the military, and then you know these people, just because you are, as a politician, you, you get use whatever space you have. And I think there's active collusion, so there is that. Um, as for Fauji Foundation and Fauji uh, conflicts, I think the commercial empire of the uh, Pakistan army has just grown and grown to a level that I'm not sure even they fully understand the scale of it in Pakistan. DHAs, I think more than the conflicts, is of course the defense housing authorities in Pakistan, and, and they're the biggest landowners, commercial, uh, in the country. So um, that itself is having strange effects, and I think this is also something which is post-Musharraf years. I don't want to blame everything on Musharraf, this is an institutional kind of thing, but things did get turbocharged, and we're seeing like the effects of that. I think the role of money amongst the co officer corps, the actual wealth, you saw a couple of days ago, there was a report in the Pakistani media about you know, General Baja's family wealth. I don't think he had had to do anything illegal to suddenly have that exponential growth in his uh, family wealth. It is just what it is now. That's what happens when you become army chief, and when you become army chief twice over, you get twice the amount of money. So definitely, I think that's the thing. And the third thing, um, on religion, I think ostensibly in Pakistan, someone like myself would think, the military has used religion in order to both sort of perpetuate domestic control and you know, sort of interfere in politics, et cetera. But two things have happened. One, of course, the TTP insurgency uh, in the mid 2000s dance, where they lost a great number of soldiers. It's a fierce challenge to the Pakistani authority, the state authority, possibly the largest since the you know, war of independence or separation from Bangladesh. So I think, I can't say that there's a rethink but in terms of the active collusion, the jihadi element, et cetera, that we saw through the 1980s in Afghanistan with the Kashmir-centric movements, there's some kind of pause that has been hit on that. But left to its own devices, I would stress, the Pakistani society is a right of center, loosely right of center place. It is a conservative place, and it's going to have like religious uh, fla a flavor to it. And so I think you know, it's, it's not surprising whether military or civilian that they look to exploit it. Thank you. This was really, really interesting. Uh, and thinking about the hybrid regime a little bit more, uh, you've discussed political parties and the army and how they collude or work together or not work together. I'm also wondering, when we speak about the state, uh, the judiciary, you mentioned a little bit about uh, Musharraf and how the lawyers' movement and all of that played out. But can we talk a little bit more about what's happening now? What is the role of the judiciary in this hybrid regime? And uh, what's the trajectory that you see? Is it also moving in sort of a pessimistic uh, direction? Or do you think there is some independence there which uh, gives a different perspective? Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, it's a bit of both. I think the, uh, the judiciary fiercely protects its independence in its mind, particularly from civilian incursion. But Pakistan historically has had a judiciary that's also trying to get out from under the boot, right? That has changed, I think, post the gains that you saw of the lawyers' movement. I, I don't want to stress about a false dawn or anything like that. Um, but there was a moment Pakistan had where the judiciary could try and inst install itself as a separate institution of the state, if not co-equal, but protect itself from both military and civilian interference. Unfortunately, that's not happened. I think, you know, starting with the Nawaz Sharif stuff, uh, it's patently obvious some of these judgments, they're highly political. They were highly political when he was ousted, and they're highly political now when he's being sort of eased back in. Same stuff you're seeing with Imran again. So I think our judiciary does have a problem of independence, by, and this is just my view. I think the disdain for politicians in Pakistan, whether amongst generals or judges, comes from the fact that they think, look, you know, we went to school, we went to this course, we studied law, or we went to the PMA, and we worked our way up, and we paid our dues. And these people, you know, they were there, their parents were around in the 1970s, their grandparents were around before, 
they're still around right now, at least we go home, right? Like, you know, at the end of the day, General Bajwa has gone home or is going home in a couple of days. So I think the disdain comes from this idea that politicians in Pakistan are somehow not worthy of equal respect. And that allows, again, um, when you have a military leadership or even sometimes a civilian leadership, Imran, as an example, trying to use them to achieve political ends. Hi, Cyril. Uh, thanks for sharing all those views with us. Um, I'm director of programs at the Reuters Institute of Journalism, but I've been a journalist in India for many decades. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what you see as both global perception and perhaps even global engagement with Pakistan, where, to use a Facebook terminology, it's been an it's complicated relationship between Pakistan and America, a carrot and stick approach in terms of funds. There is perhaps strategic benefit in balancing Pakistan, both with relations towards India, and of course with Af Afghanistan as well. Do you think to an extent it's sort of been bred and nurtured, this, this bubbling jamboree that you have in Pakistan by global players as well, because it works to their advantage to constantly pinch and pull as desired? Sure. Um, actually, that's a really interesting question, because I think as it hasn't really sort of set, sunk in inside Pakistan. The post 9-11 phase that opened, you know, obviously, 9-11, the war in Afghanistan, those 20 years have now closed with the exit from Afghanistan of Western troops last year. And I think Pakistan genuinely, part of the dispute between Imran and General Bajwa and the other political leadership is about Pakistan's place, not just in the region, but in the world, right? We have increasingly fallen behind India when it comes to the economy. Uh, we have tried to align with China, closely, but there's also been some concern about the unfavorable terms of this, uh, you know, relationship, uh, financial in, uh, terms. Um, maybe the country and its military and political leadership have got used to easy money from the West, you know, uh, create a headache, they'll throw some money at you. And I think this is actually post the Afghan exit. Pakistan's really struggling to figure out its place, not just inside this region, but in the world uh, at large. I'll give you an example again, just because you know, he's in the news and more, a lot of people are interested. Um, Imran says, which I think you know, he has an a, a anti-West streak, right? Um, but he explains it in this way. He says, look, there's a global competition between China and the US. In this region, India is already lined up with the US. We are already with China. All the US wants from us, this is in Ran's telling, is for us to fall in line behind India, and then if we're nice, they may throw a few dollars at us. So he thinks our relationship fundamentally should be closer to China. Now that's interesting, the Pakistan army agrees with that, but it also wants to keep a one foot in the Western camp. And I think going back to, you know, it's possible to overstate politics a lot and domestic stuff, but there were genuine disagreements between General Bajwa and Imran with Bajwa and Imran on, on sort of policy matters. And Pakistan's role, Pakistan's place, not just inside South Asia, but its engagement with the West. And I think it's slowly starting to sink in that this post 9-11 phase, which ended after 20 years with the exit of troops from Afghanistan, Pakistan is now having to figure out where it is and what it wants. I don't think that you know, there's a settled answer to that as yet. Thank you very much for this lecture. I have a question um, about assets, a question about tax, and a question about regions. When you talked about civilians having responsibility for human development and at one stage economic development, you described it as residual or amorphous. And I wondered, um, I mean, a human development is actually a project in the material economy as much as anything else, but it's rather forgotten. Who owns what? And does responsibility map onto the control of assets in the various sectors that the military and the civilians are supposed to be <laughs> competing sure, over? Yeah. Second question, can I just ask my question? Sorry, sorry, Second question is related to the first. Um, 
what is responsible for the revenue streams that the state quarrels over or competes over? Is it from the military? Is it from the civilian? Is the economy mostly black or informal? Um, do you get my drift? Sure. And yeah. thirdly, is the balance of hybridity different in the different provinces of Pakistan? Right, yeah. Um, I can try and answer those in reverse. Yes, uh, of course, Balochistan, our largest, geographically largest, most sparsely populated province, has effectively been run by the military since 2000. Right? There's a long-running insurgency there. There's a nominal government in place, um, but the military's in charge of that province, and that's been the case for two decades. That's not the case in Punjab, of course, and other parts of the country. Um, in Karachi, where I'm from, uh, since 2016, the major political party in the, in the city has been dismantled through a military operation. Maybe the reasoning behind it, you know, I could get behind, but some of the actions, not really. So yeah, there's, there are these regional distinctions. As for what uh, finances the Pakistani state, um, two things, uh, borrowed money from the West and remittances of workers who are working in the Middle East, et cetera. Pakistan runs a chronic budget deficit. And in fact, this is what we have periodically, um, a current account deficit. This is what we're going through again. Um, the country imports a lot more than it can afford, and it doesn't have much that the outside world wants. So the gap between inputs and exports is so large that every few years you have this balance of payment crisis in Pakistan. So um, to answer your question about where do the resources come from, uh, it's borrowed money. But the money that does come within Pakistan, I assume you meant taxation, um, largely it's through indirect taxes in the formal sector. Um, and this is something that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years. Indirect taxes are easy for a state to capture because when you have to go after somebody for an individual income tax, you've got to go to each person. But if you have sales tax at you know, sort of uh, petrol prices, for example, this is one of the big sources of revenue for the uh, government, you just tax it at the refinery stage or the port stage, and that's how you can capture a lot of the revenue. But Pakistan actually has a chronic problem of, and I think this is... This is the core problem in Bison. It's the problem of the economy, of having a sustainable economy, not just that can pay for itself, but that can provide job opportunities and doesn't keep going through these habitual crises. And I don't think anyone has the answer. I actually don't think any of the political parties have the answers. I don't think the military has the answer. Of course, it's easy to say, well, austerity, or just go back to the IMF and do these things. But there is a political economy in Pakistan where politicians are reluctant to uh, tax their own base. And it's also the case of the military because its vast commercial holdings in the country routinely gets exemptions for itself and its own businesses. So when you have this sort of rentier type of state, you have bad outcomes. I hope that answers. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mehran Baluch. I'm from Baluchistan. Uh, there's definitely an example of collusion between the military and the civil government when it comes to Baluchistan, mm. because the civil government chooses to ignore all the, since occupation of Baluchistan, all the human rights violations, the disappearances, the extrajudicial killings, and the genocide, the slow motion genocide, as Amnesty International calls it. They choose to ignore it. Consecutive governments in Pakistan, or the civil Governments, they choose to ignore it, just like the army. Um, I, I would agree. I'm, I'm not sure what the question there was, but um, I mean, Balochistan is an open sore in Pakistan, and I don't think we're any closer to one of the tragedies of Balochistan is because it's now been 20 odd years. There was a political class in the province that may have previously had a possibility of negotiating some kind of peaceful settlement to the insurgency. But because of collusion and then we kept out and so many iterations of this, I fear, this is what my friends from Balochistan, I myself have not been back to Balochistan since 2013. I would not feel safe going there if that's a measure of just how, that might be because of my own circumstances. But I think there's a real fear that this generation of Baloch youth or younger people have really become sort of disillusioned or dis, um, like turned on the Pakistani state and that this is a longer term problem because there aren't actual political avenues, moderate political avenues that previously existed. So yeah, I think for, for a lot of us, it's, it's worrying that Balochistan could get worse, not better. Yes. 
Hello, um, thank you for giving this talk to us today. Um, a slight disclaimer, um, I don't really know much about Pakistan, so this was really Neither interesting. Neither do I. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm from Karachi. You know. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm a water researcher and I'm interested in sea level rise and I'm particularly interested in the response to the floods. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the public response to the floods and what the public are thinking about the almost inertia between uh -huh. the government and between the civilian government like the yeah. the military civilian uh -huh. complex and how that tension has actually spilled over into flood relief um sure i you. mean pakistani state in general uh you know if you're poor uh and a lot of the areas which have been affected by the flooding are more rural poor uh, areas of pakistan south punjab rural sindh balochistan um as I understand, there's a great deal of anger there, but there's also a habitual anger there to begin with because they are just on the periphery to begin with. But I think it's interesting because, um, so for example, if you look at Sindh, it has been ruled by the PVP since 2008. There is no organized political opposition to PVP in Sindh. It will continue to dominate for the foreseeable future. If there's an election, they will win the election. But you have heard at the margins uh, since the flood response being so shambolic. I, I admit, or I will state that it was so overwhelming, the state of the girl, the scale of the crisis, I think it overwhelmed the best of abilities anyone had in Pakistan. But I think what you are seeing um, with these floods, particularly and if it happens repeatedly, so the last floods we had were in 2010, then it took another 10 odd years for something of this scale. If climate projections hold true and this starts becoming a, a, a repeated pattern, I think you might see greater anger building. Like for example, what's happened, there are parts of Sindh right now, which four or five months after the flooding are still inundated, they're still submerged. The, government, the Sindh government has not been able to clear out the water from there. This doesn't just mean they lost their last crop, they, they can't plant this crop, right? So that's two cycles. And these things can sort of have compounding effects. And so I think when going forward, you will see the anger building, but I will stress, in places like Sindh, Southern Punjab, etc., cetera, um, you, know, you, you might have a protest vote, but I'm not so sure that the alternative is going to be any better either, unfortunately. Thank you very much indeed. My, as you know, I spent some years living in Pakistan, and sometimes I ask myself, why is anger not building more than it does given the situation? But there's a great resilience around Pakistan, maybe too much resilience in political terms. Um, but thank you very much indeed, Sarah. And I think we, we very rarely here in Oxford get someone able to speak with such authority on the ground truth. Um, we, we know a lot about people who understand, in some ways, communities and do field work. We don't have that many people who come to talk, uh, talk to us who have spoken to all the main political players and have the kind of insights that you've been able to give. It's a fairly gloomy and as well as murky insights you've given us, um, but they've been really, really productive. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.